afternoon and welcome to the third COVID-19 community resource.com town hall meeting powered by the Center for Closing the Health Gap. I'm your moderator, Cincinnati City Council member Jan Michelle Lemon Kearney. Today we're going to talk about the impact of COVID-19 on the Black community and what resources are available to us. Um, we're going to do it a little differently this time. We're going to actually unmute you, those of you who are on Zoom. So when you have questions or comments, you're able to, to speak them yourselves. But please, please, please be brief. I can't emphasize that enough. We want to make sure we get everybody in, that everybody has a chance to comment. So uh, be brief, please. Um, if you're watching on the Health Gap Facebook live page. Um, you can still message your questions and we'll make sure that the panelists get them. Um, and those of you on phone, it's, it's the same process, okay? So as a quick reminder, this session is being recorded so that we can share it with you later. Um, just for a quick update this week, so uh, the Ohio Health, the Ohio Department of Health reported that um, now we have 15,169 confirmed cases in Ohio. That includes 690 deaths and 3,053 hospitalizations. Um, we've been hearing that one of the country's hotspots for COVID-19 actually is Ohio's prisons, especially the Marion Correctional Prison, where 80%, 80% of the inmates and 50% of the employees have tested positive for COVID-19 and there have been some deaths there as well. So this, to discuss these and other issues related to COVID-19 in Ohio and, and what's going on and what we're going to do about it, we have some fantastic panelists. You're going to hear from Bishop Bobby Hilton, who is president of the Cincinnati chapter of the National Action Network, known as NAN. He's also chief of staff for Hamilton County Commissioner Stephanie Summerill Dumas. We also have Representative Amelia Sykes from Akron, Ohio, who represents Ohio's 34th district. And Representative Sykes is our Ohio House Minority Leader. So we're so honored that she's joining us from Akron today. Um, we also have David Singleton, who is Executive Director of the Ohio Justice and Policy Center, and Dr. Clyde Henderson of the Cincinnati Medical Association. Also joining in the conversation are two of our state representatives from Cincinnati. We're so happy to see them here uh, this afternoon. Uh, Representative Catherine Ingram of the 32nd District and Representative Cedric Denson of the Fighting 33rd District. And I should add that Renee Mahaffey Harris from the Health Gap, her daughter Sloan Harris, along with John Reichel and Lauren Harden are helping us to make sure that everybody gets heard and they're going between Facebook Live and Zoom and all that to make sure everything goes well. So welcome everybody, whether you're joining us by phone or by Zoom or Facebook Live, on the Center for Closing the Health Gap page. Let's start with a few introductory remarks before we get to the attendees' um, questions and comments. So let me start, uh, Bishop Bobby Hilton, you have the floor first. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm honored to be with everyone today and it's good to see everybody uh, progressing and in good health. This is an unprecedented moment and I just encourage everyone to Take the precautions. Um, you know, we heard the governor make an announcement about Ohio opening up really soon, but we need to understand that uh, Ohio has not reached its peak in this thing. Uh, this was a very disturbing week. This past week was a very disturbing week. Uh, we're still climbing. We're still adding a lot more people uh, that are being uh, infected by this virus. So let's all be careful. Let's uh, just keep reaching out to each, each other and loving on each other. And one thing for sure, we're going to make it through this. Thank you so much, Bishop Hilton. Um, I don't know if David Singleton is on yet. Renee, is David on? Um, he's... I'm here. I'm on. Okay. Oh, hey, you... Michelle. Hey, how are you? Well, welcome. So this Good. is Singleton from the Ohio Justice and Policy Center. David, a few intro remarks by you would be great. Well, sure. First of all, thanks for having me. Hello to everybody. Please stay safe. Uh, at the OJPC, we are focused on 
what's happening in the prisons. We are a nonprofit public interest law firm. We represent prisoners. And while the governor has done a good job overall in our state, uh, managing the COVID crisis. It's been um, a really challenging time in the prisons and he should have earlier, much earlier uh, work to try and reduce the prison population because that's one of the ways that you prevent the spread. When you are locked up, you don't have a fighting chance to avoid uh, infection because you are sleeping three feet apart from other people in dorms. Uh, social distancing is not going to be able to be um, realistic. And so now we're dealing with some of the hottest spots in the country, uh, one at Marion Correctional Institution, where over 2,000 prisoners uh, are infected, and um, at Pickaway Correctional Institution, where uh, there are also a lot of folks infected, infected. And we've had 15 deaths total in the system. So hopefully that number is not going to grow uh, too much more. I'm really worried. We're working 24 seven to try and uh, get as many prisoners out as we possibly can. And I'd look forward to answering your questions uh, later about uh, what's happening in the prisons and jails. Okay, David, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Sure. Claude Henderson, would you like to give us some, a few intro remarks? Okay, Dr. Henderson. All right, it? now. Are you still here? Okay, good. I'm still here. <laughs> thank great. you, sorry for the little mishap there. Um, I'm um, honored to uh, be here. I'm, a, uh, I'm the treasurer of the uh, Cincinnati Medical Association, uh, representing the interests of the African-American physicians in our community, as well as the, uh, our uh, patients that we treat. Um, as we all know, the healthcare disparities play a huge role um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And when you have a pandemic like this, it affects us even more. Um, so I'm here to answer any questions I can from a, a medical standpoint, and it's a joy being here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Representative Amelia Sykes, um, would you please introduce yourself and just give us an overview about what's going on in Ohio? Hi, and thank you. And first, let me uh, recognize and acknowledge the organizers for putting this uh, wonderful conversation together, closing the health gap. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, Councilwoman Kearney, I don't think I've told you formally, congratulations to you in your new role. So, so glad to see you there uh, representing your community well. Um, I'm Amelia Sykes. I'm a state representative for Ohio's 34th House District. So I'm not too far from uh, my wonderful colleagues, Rep. Ingram in 32nd and uh, Rep. Denson in the 33rd. I'm 34th, even though I'm all the way in Northeast Ohio. Uh, but I'm uh, really glad to be a part of the conversation uh, with our neighbors down, <coughs> down south. And, you know, the, when we talk about, um, and when I've been talking about what the impact of COVID is on the Black community, I have focused greatly on the health disparities. And that's just because of my background um, in the public health field, uh, but mostly because it is a matter of life and death. And it became very clear as this started to unfold that we were going to see health disparities uh, in the black community. We see health disparities in virtually uh, every health outcome that there could be from maternal health and infant mortality, uh, from diabetes and asthma rates. And so it shouldn't have been shocking to anyone to see similar disparities in something uh, like COVID-19. However, the response from the administration has been a bit shocking uh, that it has been that way. Uh, although, if we were to just look a little bit further in in history, it should not have been. And so I've been, while very uh, complimentary of the governor, uh, very critical of the fact that this was not something addressed early in the process. And even as we addressed it, uh, it's taken some time to uh, work on the needs of our community. Now, it's not only an issue when it comes to health disparities and what is actually happening, what, what in fact is, uh, although we are a smaller amount of the population of this state, uh, we make up a greater amount of COVID cases and hospitalizations. And in my community, um, it, the numbers are startling. We are twice as about 15% of the population in my county and over 30% of the cases, as well as uh, over nearly half of the hospitalization. So um, as you can tell, it's hitting us in a disproportionate way. Uh, now, I have to say this every single time, but I know the people in this call already know this. 
it is not because there's anything inherently wrong with black people that make us or that we're doing wrong to make us uh, more likely to be victims of this disease. It is due to structural racism um, and policies like redlining and, and equal access to jobs and education uh, that make us more susceptible. So I make it uh, abundantly clear whenever I have the opportunity to say it is not us as human beings. There's nothing inherently wrong with us. It is in fact systemic racial issues that have uh, existed and continue to persist over decades. And then if we don't address those, we won't address that. The final thing I will say is that when you look at the frontline or the essential employees, they tend to be people of color who are working in low income, minimum wage jobs. Uh, and these are the folks who every single day show up with smiles on their faces to make sure that we have food to eat, that our communities are clean, uh, that we are still able to participate in the world as best as we can. Um, and, they are being exposed without good policies and uh, equipment. Um, and again, it's one more way that we are being uh, impacted in a disproportionate way. So I look forward to this conversation. I'll stop uh, running my mouth here and uh, thank you again for allowing me to uh, join you all today. Thank you so much, Representative Sykes. Um, as I said, we also have uh, Representatives Ingram and, and uh, Denson. So Representative Ingram, do you care to make any intro remarks? I actually hadn't planned to, but hopefully I'm here to listen. And of course, as part of the Democratic Caucus, uh, one of the things that we talk about is how we work for you. So I'm hoping that we get the kind of questions from folks that allow us to try to pose ourselves to come to some good solutions because I do believe that if there is a silver lining there are opportunities for us to start to do things differently which we're going to have to do uh, whether it's uh, recognizing that uh, disproportionate numbers of African Americans who have the virus or anything else as far as health care the way we treat our people hopefully will change coming out of this thing and we have to hold folks feet to the fire so thank you for allowing me to say something Thank you so much. Um, Representative Denson, would you like to make any comment at the beginning here? Thank you, council member. And thank you to um, Renee Mahaffey Harris at the Center for Closing the Health Gap and the entire team. Um, it has been uh, a really, really long hill to climb, but I'm certain that we will get through this. Um, these are the kind of conversations that I get excited about as I looked across all the panelists today. We have enough experts here to really start to weigh in and really help out the folks that we're all trying to serve. And that's the community. Uh, David Singleton talked about the prison population. That's something that I've been paying very, very close attention to, working on very hard all this week. Some of the issues, we are getting a lot of constituents, families who are reaching out saying, we've got loved ones that are there and this is happening and that's happening and what can you do about it? So these are the opportunities where we have the experts, we're hearing the stories, and we can have the conversations to try to make some of those things better so we get the outcomes that we deserve and so desperately need in these disparaging times. So grateful to be here and happy to weigh in where I can. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. I just want to remind um, other attendees, I see that um, Dr. Robin Ford, Judge Tyrone Yates, Eric Kearney, and a few others are making comments in the chat room. If you would like to be unmuted, let us know because you can, this week, you can actually speak out. So, okay. So, all right, let's go to the questions. Um, I have a question here and it is directed to Representative Sykes. Uh, it says about, 3,700 people in Ohio are being tested daily, which isn't much. Is there a plan to increase testing? Thank you for that question. And it is um, a very important one. Um, it's, it's very clear that the testing in Ohio is woefully inadequate and there's not a better phrase for it than that. And I'll just call it what it is. Uh, when we've been asking and have been asking and Rep Ingram's been asking and Rep Denson's been asking, where are the tests, where are the tests, where are the tests? Uh, we've gotten a little bit of mixed messages, but, I, but recently the answer has been the uh, lack of ability to obtain either cotton swabs or the reagent or the plastic tubes and the supply chain crumbled when uh, 
so much shut down in China. And so that, that just exposes one of the many problems uh, with the structure of the United States and in our supply chain, as well as our social safety net. But the fact that we don't have testing is because we just haven't been able to acquire the materials to do the tests. Um, and that is a major problem. And it is incredibly uh, challenging to think that on May 1st, which is about five days from now, six days from now, uh, we are going to reopen when we cannot adequately test enough of the population to see where we are going to uh, need to invest our resources and stop the spread. And the governor announced on a Friday that there was a new collaboration with an Ohio-based company where they'll be able to uh, create and manufacture the testing reagent. And there's another company that's going to supply the cotton swabs so that they that's the the thing that goes up people's nose so hopefully that'll get us what we're looking at but that's not going to be online for at least another uh, couple of weeks so uh, i know it wasn't the question about reopening on may 1st but i have some serious doubts about whether or not we're ready for that because even as that comes online and their testing capacity is supposed to grow uh, we will still be at the bottom of the pack, because right now, Ohio per capita has the lowest testing rate in the entire country. And so we've done a lot of things well, but that one is one of the things that we have not done well. So uh, stay tuned for that and what uh, this new collaboration that the governor announced on Friday will be, but without a doubt, uh, testing has been woefully inadequate. I'm not going to sugarcoat it and pretend as it is anything else. And if you have concerns, I have the same concerns um, and my colleagues in the state house have had them as well. Thank you so much. You know, and we're going to get back to talking about, you know, are we ready to, to actually open up? I mean, I have some real concerns about that too. There's some questions in the queue. So before, before we go back to that, um, let me get to uh, the next question is for David Singleton. Um, and the question is, um, is the Ohio Justice and Policy Center seeing more people who've been released from prisons now? And if so, what are their major needs? Well, um, our focus right now is trying to free as many people as we can. Um, and that's, that's been a real challenge. Um, judges need to step up and grant judicial releases um, more liberally than perhaps they would before because we've got a lot of folks who, you know, have done their sentence, doing their time constructively, and when they went into prison, it wasn't for a death sentence. It was for whatever term or years are supposed to supposed to uh, face. So most of our effort has been on making sure we can get people out because the reality is the few people we've been able to get out have a place to go where they can safely quarantine with their family. That is not by and large been the issue. We have um, partners in the social service community um, locally. Um, Talbert House is one of them that is able to provide a, a vast array of social service programs for people who are coming out. So it's less a re-entry issue, it's more about getting people released. Unfortunately, the governor has been very narrow in his use of his power to set people free. He could, he could have done a lot more and instead is focused only on a very narrow band of people, less than 200, um, to, to set free. And really, we need to be setting a few thousand people free so that the prison system has enough space that when people do get sick, there's enough room to isolate them and keep everybody else safe. All right. Thank you very much. Um, the next uh, comment is from Iris Rowley. I know the producer John said that I can unmute Iris. Renee, I don't see how I'm how I can do that. So if you could unmute Iris, that would be great. And John, if you could just explain to me in the chat room what I need to do. Renee, are you able to unmute Iris Rowley? Um, Iris said that she prefers to not be unmuted. Um, but I we want what I would like to do is acknowledge the fact that Iris Rowley and uh, Reverend Damon Lynch III were able to secure a testing site at the Mercy Health Center in Bond Hill for the community. Um, but um, I think Iris can join us. I'm gonna open up so that she can join us. Okay. 
Okay, Iris, would you like to comment? Okay, and um, my daughter just came up and showed me how to unmute. So we're, I think we're good to go. <laughs> Um, okay, there is another question, and this one is for Bishop Bobby Hilton. So how is the National Action Network, NAN, responding to the disparate impact of COVID-19 in the Black community? Well, our president, Reverend Sharpton, has been having uh, these type of uh, uh, venues on every week. Matter of fact, he'll have one on tomorrow night, which kind of goes nationwide. And we're just trying to alert the community of the various uh, places they can go uh, to get information. There, there are people that are in certain communities that are hungry. There are people that are in certain communities that uh, need more information regarding uh, testing. And there are a lot of people, even calling here locally in Cincinnati, that want to know how can we get information regarding our loved ones that are incarcerated. So I'm, I'm really glad that uh, uh, Mr. Singleton is here, and because we've tried to address that question, I mean, a lot of calls come in, and I don't know what's going on, but apparently families aren't able to get in touch with their loved ones. They, they're not able to find out what are their conditions, are they ill, are they okay, and I don't know if there's a central number or a better way uh, we can give to family members regarding um, how they can reach and find out how their loved ones are doing in prison. So uh, there's a national drive by our president, Reverend Sharpton, and locally, we're trying to make sure we're getting information to families. Okay, thank you so much, Bishop Hilton. Okay, so let me, Iris Rowley did leave a comment, and she said um, she wants to make sure that the, that the community is informed of CEIA's, um, CEAI's uh, push for a testing site in the black community. Um, as everybody knows, we had great news this week. Um, CEAI uh, led by uh, Reverend Damon Lynch III, Iris Rowley, Cinnamon Pelly, Kristen Kitchen and others um, opened up a clinic in Mercy Health. It's gonna be open for the next 30 days, Monday through Saturday, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, and if you have the, the CDC priorities, you can get tested. Um, the CEAI is working on a second site as well, but right now that site that's open is 1701 Mercy Health Way. I still call it the old Showcase Cinema in Bond Hill, but it's right there next to Corinthian Baptist in Bond Hill. So Iris wants to make sure everybody knows that. Okay, um, so here's another question, um, and it says, are we really ready to open up Ohio? I was going to ask this of Representative Sykes, so I'll give her first stab at it, but I would love to hear what everyone has to say. Are we ready to open up Ohio? What does that mean? No, uh, I don't think we're ready to open up Ohio uh, just yet. Uh, and the reason I say that is because, you know, I know people are anxious to get back to work, to get to whatever they consider normal. Uh, but there are just a few things we need to lay down as some groundwork before we get to that point. First of all is uh, whatever normal people, uh, whatever people think normal is, it's not going to be uh, until uh, we see a vaccination uh, and uh, some significant changes in behavior uh, and so that the spread of the vaccine doesn't work. And that just means staying at, still staying at home and, and washing your hands a little bit more and uh, not being as communal as, as we're used to being. And I know that's very challenging for us uh, in our community because that's really what the basis of uh, how we've had to survive is. And so... Uh, one, we have to get out of our head that we're not going to go back to where we were uh, about six weeks ago. It's just going to be a little bit different. And two, uh, as we talked about before, we just don't have enough testing. We don't know who uh, has the, the virus and two, who's had the virus and may very well be uh, immune to it in some capacity. And I was just reading before I got on this phone call that the World Health Organization is cautioning about those who may have had COVID, uh, they may not actually be immune to a second exposure to it. And, and so we're just not sure because there's just so much we don't know um, about the novel coronavirus. It's new to us. And so uh, the other reason I say we're not ready is because we don't have a plan. We haven't heard a plan. Uh, the governor is going to announce something tomorrow, which I do hope uh, includes things like 
robust testing, um, and particularly testing in, in uh, jails, in nursing homes, and in communities that have been hit hardest, like our Black communities. Uh, we need to have sufficient tracing of people who may have had exposure. Um, and the other thing that, you know, we talk about the tracing um, of those individuals with exposures, but we don't really talk about what that means. That means we're probably going to find even more people who are going to be required to quarantine and stay at home for 14 days. So people I don't think are quite ready for what it means when we completely uh, expand these tracing capabilities. But again, we also don't have the workforce to do it either. So that there's an issue with trying to figure out who the people are that's going to do that. Uh, we need to make sure we have enough personal protection equipment for the hospitals and those essential employees, uh, including the essential employees that are working at McDonald's and working at our uh, grocery stores, uh, who in my neighborhood, uh, it was just a black neighborhood, I don't see them with uh, gloves or masks and they are not getting it from their employees. So again, a problem we have to fix before we start talking about, we have more people being exposed to one another and we don't know what they may or may not be carrying around because it could be asymptomatic. Uh, we need to make sure that our employees are also protected uh, when they're employed employees are not uh, working in the best faith. Uh, if I have asthma or if I have high blood pressure or diabetes and I'm concerned about coming back to work, what is my recourse if my employer says I have to come back? That now means that that unemployment compensation might dry up for me uh, because I do have a job. What am I supposed to do? Am I going to risk my life for this job or I'm just going to take the loss? We don't have a plan for any of this. And then the one thing uh, that completely continues to be missed is what's going to happen with these kids. We didn't close school down for the rest of the year. Child care facilities are closed and you want people to go back to work. Who going to watch their kids? They can't stay at home if they're, you know, six or seven or eight years old. They're not supposed to be spending time with their grandparents. What are the parents supposed to do? So we need to have a plan for all that. And, you know, I know it's a hard job and I'm trying not to be a uh, completely the backseat driver and all this, but these are the things my constituents are calling me about and they deserve answers. And um, I want to have them to have answers. And I want to help provide them for them, but we have to um, have a whole lot more put in place before we start talking about where we, how we are going to reopen. So I'm gonna go back to the first thing. I'm just saying, no, we're not ready yet. You know, I totally agree, Representative Sykes. I don't know if anyone has, has a different opinion. Um, I know there are people protesting about reopening. They seem to be more concerned about the economy than, than life. And, you know, I mean, I think life has to trump, trump economy. You know, we, uh, we definitely need to survive. You know, we've got we've to gotta make a living, but um, we can't put people's lives at danger. Um, so, and you, you mentioned education. So here's a question from Dr. Robin Ford, who says, um, has WCET TV, which has an educational FCC broadcast TV license, given priority to Cincinnati public schools using their broadcast channel on air for basic public education? Um, and then Dr. Ford says, the digital divide excludes many of our students who lack internet access at home. I can mention that I know on channel 804, uh, CPS, Cincinnati Public Schools broadcasts classes all day. Um, so I'm not sure about CET, but the, the digital divide question is something that um, I think our panelists could address. Would anyone like to take that one on? So many of our kids really don't have computers. Um, it's, it's, well, gotta do thank you. Yeah. Uh, if I may, I want to say that that, of course, is one of the things that we have to look at in making corrections. I, I will say that we've been pushing for broadband across the state for a while now. And it's not just, I will say that there are many um, uh, urban school children who don't have that access still. But the issue is also a rural issue. And the state should take care of that in trying to make sure that broadband is is available for most of our students as far as that is concerned. With, uh, with the channel for PBS, there are lots of resources that our teachers can get to. And I, I will give a shout out to those teachers. They are doing a phenomenal job of trying to get to those resources also. And the uh, Ohio uh, Broadcast Education Media folks, uh, they are working hard and that CET PBS connection is there and WOSU, there are all kinds of, of resources. The issue is, is that what do we do differently 
to make sure that those folks have access. And then of course, we've got the, we always know that we already have, a, a, we're gonna have a summer slide. Every year we've had a summer slide. We call it that so that when we go back in the fall, it's there. We're gonna have a coronavirus slide plus the summer slide. And then nobody really knows when school is gonna open up or how it's gonna open up. So these are real issues that the, uh, that the governor's office and, and the Department of Education, all of us have to really start to look at the bigger picture of how that's gonna work for these students. Did I get lost? No, I think we still got you. I don't know if we still have uh, our hosts. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to keep rambling. So I said, um, um, "Thank you." Um, I don't know what our moderator. Uh, However, um, we can keep moving here until um, she comes back. Our next question. If Mr. Singleton can address how families may be able to get in touch with their loved ones that are incarcerated, mm -hmm. apparently, especially where there's a high prevalence of that infection rate, do you have any suggestions we may be able to give to the community? Yeah, it's, um, it's going to be a challenge. Um, we have had, even as lawyers, we've had some difficulty getting in touch with folks like at Marion and Pickaway just because it's all hands on deck at those institutions. And the case managers, some of them are out sick. So that's why there has been difficulty. It's not bad will on the part of the institution. Um, but I would say be patient. Uh, try and speak to the case manager if you can, um, and you can call the main prison line and give your loved ones a prisoner number and they'll be able to tell you who the case manager is if you don't know that. And um, from there, uh, you're supposed to be able to get um, some free calls and some free videos. And again, that's going to break down a little bit given um, the crisis at some places. At most institutions that aren't as bad off as Marion and Pickaway, for instance, communication is happening um, the way it normally does. So that's the good news. The bad news is if you're Pickaway or Marion, expect some delays. Thank you, sir. Sure, thank you. Oh, good. We're still, okay. Okay, is everybody, I'm sorry, I don't know what happened. I got cut off, but um, I don't want, I, I don't know if anybody was mid-sentence, but let me jump back in. So David, there was a message from Iris and she wanted you to um, explain who has it been trolled to let people out of prisons and does this process work? If not, how can we fix it? Also, is there anyone working on the release of children? Okay, on the question about um, who has the power, there's several uh, entities and individuals who have power to release folks. Starting at the top at the governor, the governor's got the um, absolute power to grant commutations and reprieves. Um, there is a process that can take some time, but the governor has the ability to do that. There's also a statute, a state statute, um, that uh, allows the DRC director with the blessing of the governor to release certain people to reduce an overcrowding emergency. And right now we have an overcrowding emergency. Uh, not only do we have a system that's designed for 38,000 that's got 49,000 in it, but we've got um, an infectious disease running rampant through the system. So under that power, the DRC director um, could only release people who have committed lower level crimes and who have, uh, who have only 90 days to go on their sentence. They get out early, you know, 90 days earlier. That's about 1,200 people. It's not a lot, but um, I wish that the governor would give 
Annette Chambers Smith, who's our prison system director, the power to do it. Um, this lays at the governor's feet. Just want to be clear about that. It's not the director's feet, the governor's feet. Uh, then the parole board has the ability to grant paroles to people uh, who uh, have served their minimum time. And historically, the parole board has been very stingy about granting releases. It's something that we have been working really hard on at OJPC to reform the way that the board operates. Uh, they're starting to release a few more people, but they need to do more. Judges have a lot of power too, because uh, a, a great number of people who are in the prison system uh, could be judicially re released after they serve a certain period of time, given the nature of their crime um, and, and their sentence. And we have been stepping up and trying to uh, coordinate a mass judicial release filing campaign um, in Hamilton County. We're working with the public defender's office on that. We're doing some other counties as well. And there's some organizations across the state that are also trying to file as many of these motions to give judges the power to release people. And there are um, also lawyers who are working to, uh, to, to get uh, young people out of juvenile detention facilities as well. And again, those powers um, rest with the governor in some instance, if he wanted to commute sentences or adjudications, um, as well as um, with the judges themselves who could grant relief. Okay, thank you very much. Um, you know, and just thinking about uh, in the in the prisons, those who are there, it doesn't seem like they're able to do things like you know social distancing. Um, I understand that some, in some of the prisons, like maybe it might be Marion that that was mentioned, um, like there are two hundred men who use one bathroom. Um, you know, it just I mean, no wonder numbers are so high. That's exactly right. You cannot socially distance in most prisons. Maybe you can if you're at a place like um, the Ohio State Penitentiary, which is a supermax, and you're in your cell for 23 hours a day and you're only taken out one at a time. Maybe you'll be safe from the virus there. But particularly in the prisons that have lower security levels, folks are in dorms and they're sleeping three feet apart and you know, you'll have several hundred people in a dorm. There's just no way you can be safe in that environment. So, and then I, you know, so from prisons to our Hamilton County Jail, I know, I think there are about 800 and something folks uh, there in the Hamilton County Jail now. There were a lot more, maybe 1,600. I think uh, the judges have tried to release a lot. Um, the sheriff, Sheriff Neal said that the judges gave him permission to also release some, but he's only released about 15 because he said the judges let everybody else out. So, um, so you know, how are things there? Even there, I mean, I've, you know, the way I've seen the way it looks like the cells are around the pod and everybody comes out to the pod. So I don't see where there's social distancing even here at home in the, in the jail. The one, the one good thing I would say is that while people can come out into the pod, at least you have single cells now um, as a res result of reducing the population down from 1,200 to 800. And the one thing I want to say on that is we've been saying, it's not just OJPC, a whole bunch of people in the community, the public defenders included. And by the way, kudos to the public defenders, uh, Hamilton County public defenders for really pushing hard um, to reduce the jail population. They don't get enough credit for the hard work they do and I want to lift them up for that. But we've been saying all along, we have too many people in our jail and now it takes a crisis to get down to 800 and that's still too many. And when this crisis ends, we don't need to go back up to 1200. Um, and, and I think that the crisis gives us an opportunity to evaluate how we are doing lots of things, including how many people we have locked up in our jails and our prisons. Okay, thank you, David. Um, so I know we've got some callers on the line. Um, Renee, if you would please unmute Chandra. And Chandra, you may ask your question. How are we doing there? Also, Deborah Rogers follows Chandra. Okay, well, you know what? While they're being unmuted, let me go to some questions that are in the queue. 
um, we're getting a lot here, so this is great. Um, okay, so the next is from Dr. Sherry Adams Davis, and she said this is for any of the panelists. Um, as an educator, parents have asked me, will there be a vaccine available prior to having their children admitted to school in the fall? And if not, what would be the risk of opening schools in the fall? Would anyone like to answer that? From a, um, this is Dr. Henderson. From a medical standpoint, the uh, likelihood of a vaccine being available before school would open in the fall is very, very low. Uh, vaccine production generally takes between a year and 18 months. Um, and that's on the, I mean, I shouldn't say generally, but that's the fast track would be a year to 18 months. Generally, it could take up to three years. And if you just, um, by the time you come up with a vaccine, then you have to um, get it out to the entire public and get everybody in, um, inoculated. And that's gonna probably take another year. So like, in all likelihood, it's going to be sometime in 2022 before we would have enough people vaccinated to have a good enough um, immunity across the United States and across the world so that we don't get those uh, exponential rises in the, uh, this disease. So for September, that's probably not going to happen. And we're gonna to have to continue to rely upon those um, things which have uh, been shown to help us to mitigate this um, uh, disease, which is social distancing, washing your hands, wearing a mask, which is obviously gonna be pretty hard to do for kids, um, all of those things. But um, the fall is not a time when we're, we're likely to have a vaccine. So, you know, that's really concerning because I don't think it's even possible for young children or even children in high school to social distance, how, you know, 35 in a classroom, um, that, that just seems like that's going to be impossible. So we, we might need to rethink this. This goes back to the whole opening up Ohio and opening up schools. Um, you know, that's, that's pretty scary. Um, okay, here's a, this question is from Kelly Prather. And she said, this question is for Representative Sykes, Representative Ingram, or Representative Denson. Are there any plans to do a statewide disparity study or task force? If so, will it include the, the committee? Um, will, I'm sorry, it, will it include minority health care professionals? I'll go ahead and take that one, Kelly. Thank you so much for the question. So yes and no. Uh, the governor announced last week a minority health strike force, which will, uh, well, is, uh, I'm, I'm assuming the plan is to identify the needs and then address the needs of minority communities, uh, particularly uh, black community. And there are at the moment 38 members of that task force, but I do believe it is still growing and it does include medical professionals from across the state. Uh, one thing I do want to mention as we're talking about this is, again, as I said in the beginning of my comments, health disparities are uh, predictable and that means they're preventable. And we could have addressed this weeks ago, uh, but we didn't. And so what my goal is, and I am a member of that task force and I have been pressing the uh, leadership to let us know how much money is going to be allocated for this and how quickly is the work going to start. Uh, because we don't need to sit and talk more about health disparities and how they occur and who's impacted and when and why. We, we have the information that we have decades worth of studies uh, that have shown how health disparities exist in our communities. And so if we have a strike force, not a task force, a strike force, we got to strike while the iron is hot. It is hot. And so we need to get to work yesterday. And especially if we're talking about reopening the state, Without a plan, one part of that plan, the first part of that plan should be how are we going to address the needs of the Black community who is being hit the hardest with the coronavirus and intervene where we know where the need is and not uh, what one of my former colleagues would say, spread the resources across like peanut butter so everybody get an equal amount. This is not the time to do that. We need to put the resources right where they need to go because not only is it the moral thing to do, it is a scientifically effective thing to do. And if neither one of those things uh, are, are uh, of your fancy, it is the way to save taxpayer dollars. So that is the, uh, the status of the strike force. Um, and hopefully it'll have some meaningful work behind it. And it's not just a group of people just to meet, just to be meeting. 
I love that. Strike force, not task force. We don't need another study. We need action. That is, that is such a great point. Thank you so much for that. Um, so still to our um, legislators, uh, Sandra's question is, how can we legislate property owners of senior housing and nursing homes uh, to provide PPEs, personal protective equipment? Um, help me with that just a little because I'm, the way I'm hearing it is that we would legislate and demand that as a requirement that they have PPEs yes. on, on, okay. Uh, and, and of course, when we look at here again, back to uh, from the, the health department, I think that that's one of the things that we have to look at. What is the requirement? How do we keep those uh, personal protective uh, equipment there at, at those facilities, but also I have an issue with somebody who is a, a, a contractor who does business at the nursing home doing certain deliveries. And unfortunately, they were, have been blocked from ordering PPEs on their own. So I have an issue back to the state as well as back to the federal government. Why are they blocking certain individual orders for those folks to get it without making sure that those nursing homes have been prioritized to receiving that equipment. So that's one that I know for certain that the governor has heard because I, uh, we made sure that we called the governor's office and let him know that. So I'm not sure if there is at some law that comes in, but there are certain standards that need to be met and are required to be met anyway. So we have to push the idea that why aren't they being done? Why isn't it there? And then how have we prioritized getting that, those PPEs to those folks? Because they're, it, despite the fact that they keep talking about who's making masks and who's making swabs and, and we've got a million going here and a million going there, the reality is, is those folks are not getting that equipment in those nursing homes and daycares. Those daycares that have been set up for our first, our first, our frontline post folks, the, uh, the um, folks that are required to be there at work, police officers, et cetera, et cetera, they're not getting that. And, and it's, it's been blocked. So we need to make sure that that discontinues happening. Representative Denson, do you want to weigh in on that? I, I do. I want to also go back to what the, the leader talked about we've really got to be looking at everything. I mean, we're grateful for folks like the Center for Closing the Health Gap. The data is there on the health disparities within our community. So when we look at these strike force, as we call it, we have got to start working now. So kind of, because I've been thinking about Kelly's question, I'm going to be paying close attention to what is happening with that because we are very, very good at coming in a room we're talking about a problem where we already have the numbers for, we already know what the situation is, but the question is, what is the action? And so I'm gonna be paying very close attention to what the action is. And I've spoke to all of the members, at least from Hamilton County that are a part of that strike force to make sure that we're having constant conversations because out of that kind of stuff, some things happen where we need to start then looking at what legislation is going to look like going forward and policies. And that's one thing that COVID has taught us is that we can learn a lot from this about how we just govern ourselves accordingly going forward. And so I'm going to be looking at that very closely because this is not the time to waste. And when I'm looking at nursing homes to come up on the next question, nursing homes and prisons are of course two different things, but when you look at the nature of how they're ran, most of those residents, they are staying put in those places and the only people coming and going are the people that work there. That's sort of the same nature of how we're looking at our prisons. So as we're looking at both of those, we need to sort of make sure that we're keeping close together. These are two entities that we need to make sure that anything that we're putting in place policy-wise, that we're paying attention to understand that these are two entities that sort of look the same in, as sort of their makeup. The only people that are leaving at night are the folks that are going home that are workers and coming back in the morning. And so how are we dealing with that and what are we doing? Are there things that we need to get really down in the weeds of dealing with when we're talking about policy? Uh, prior to being a legislator, a lot of people know I was the chief of staff at City Hall. We were always very, very good about reaching those high level things that made sense to us at the time, but we didn't realize six months in, a year in, and, and some years later that what we did did not actually give us the result that we were looking for because we were moving too fast. 
So the question becomes, how do we move fast, but make sure that we're being very, very critical and constructive about putting a plan together that is taking care of everybody? Okay. Can I add you. something to that social distancing? Absolutely. Uh, something was brought to me, to my attention, um, that was saying there are family members that have tested positive, maybe spent a short time in the hospital and then sent home to quarantine. But oftentimes those homes that they go to, their family members there, and they can't, they're, they don't have the distance. They don't have enough room in those homes to stay away from other family members. And now the virus spreads to, to the family. How is this going to be addressed? Or is it even something that's on anybody's radar? Yeah, so, so Bishop Hilton, that is a great question. Um, and that's, that's been a problem for, I think, a lot of people in the Black community. Um, you know, we're going home to, um, you know, we have multi-generational people living in our household. So we, you know, we're taking care of, of parents and children and everybody's in there together. And that, that's a huge problem. Where do people go? I talked to a firefighter who said um, he had to go to the Weston Hotel because his daughter um, has, I think she has asthma. And so he couldn't, he had a quarantine, um, but he couldn't quarantine at home. Um, you know, luckily he could afford the Weston and, you know, I'm hoping there's some reimbursement for that. But, but the point is, what do you do if you can't afford that? You know, that's, that's what a lot of the homeless population population is facing as well. I know a lot of groups like Maslow's Army, Brian Gary, they're out there um, trying to get people in hotels, but that, that's a big issue. How do people self-quarantine when they're in an environment where they're affecting other people? Um, well, without me talking so much, let me get to the next question. Uh, it's a Facebook question from Jenny Brown, and she said, this is, this is a tough one, she said, what are the numbers based on race being released? And I know all the numbers aren't in. We can see that you know we are affected more, but um, she's asking about numbers. Who would like to fill that question? I, I can help with some of that. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the Ohio Legislative Black Caucus started requesting uh, disaggregated data, data broken down by uh, geographic and racial uh, or particularly racial information and looking at not only zip codes, but if even possible census track data. And the first wave of that information, uh, it was that in the entire state, and, and if I don't know Hamilton County specific numbers, so I apologize for that. But while black Ohioans make up about 12 to 13% of the population, at that time we were around 15 or 16% of the cases, uh, but there were still 20% uh, 20 to 25% of people not checking the box on race, race or ethnicity. And so we didn't have a good picture, but it was starting to line up to show that those disparities uh, were there. And so now that we've done a little bit more outreach and pushing people as well as the healthcare providers to insist on that information uh, to get in, we've seen that disparity turn from 12% um, you know, of the population, 15 or 16% of the cases to now upwards of 22% of the cases. And the omission rate is decreasing and you're seeing that statewide as well. So again, there's still the data collection issue uh, that we need to get to, but now that we're seeing the more complete picture, the disparities are showing itself, exposing itself as uh, many of us predicted. And so the, in addition to, those are the cases that I'm sharing with you, but when we look at hospitalizations, uh, right. those numbers start shifting a little bit as well, and deaths look a little bit different too, um, and then they vary greatly uh, by geographic uh, area, and so, uh, you know, it is one of the reasons why we will continue, and I hope that this strike force will be able to push the data collection um, across the state to be more effective. And then the other part of that is, um, one, whenever death, it is a requirement and vital statistics requirement to have the race on the death certificate. So that information wasn't being analyzed fast enough so we couldn't get that information. But also when hospitals are getting this information, uh, there was some issue, you may have heard about it if you watch the press conferences and, and some of the other private entities with getting information to the government because they were calling it you know, their proprietary information, they weren't trying to release it. Since then, we've been able to get a better 
um, get better information from some of these hospital systems, um, which have helped complete the data. So it's been multi steps in doing it, but there's still more to go uh, so we can fully get the picture, but it is very clear that the disparities exist. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Chandra is in the queue and she is waiting to ask her question. Chandra, go ahead. Renee, is she unmuted? Okay, Chandra, can you hear us? All right, we're gonna come back to you. We're gonna come back to Chandra. How about Deborah? Deborah Rogers? Hello, can you hear us? Okay, I can hear you. Can you hear me? We can hear you perfectly. Okay. Right. Yes. Oh, good, good. Um, a couple of questions that I had um, have been answered, but I want to thank the committee or uh, the panel for coming, you know, for getting together and coming up with trying to give information out so that we in the communities could be aware of what's going on. The, and the two other things I would like to ask about is, um, is there a requirement for the test sites, you know, do you have to have a referral from a doctor or do you just go and get tested? And the other thing I want to know about was, um, do they have what is referred to as a pandemic daycare? And like a lot of these daycares that had to be closed down, what would be the requirement for them to have a pandemic daycare. Okay, thank you very much. Who would like to answer that? That might be either Dr. Henderson or Renee Mahaffey Harris. Um, I'll take the one about the uh, referral for the um, testing. Okay. Um, at, at this point, you you have to have a referral from either your a physician or a healthcare provider. It would be a physician's assistant or a nurse practitioner. Um, the, the good news about, we're speaking about the site uh, uh, at Mercy where Dr. Keith Melvin, who's one of our members, is actually coordinating that. They actually do some screening there. And if you have, if you meet the criteria that are set aside, set out by the uh, CDC, then they will go ahead and get you processed from the standpoint of getting you the test. So that's at that site. And I've talked to him personally about that. So I know that that's, ha that's what's happening there. But you still, according to state uh, uh, rules, you still have to have a referral, but he can generate the referral there and they can go ahead and do the test if you come there. And it's not only drive-in, but they, they also will take walk-ups and people who come on the buses. And that's been one of the big problems with testing uh, that has excluded the African-American community because if they're all drive-through, then you know obviously we don't necessarily have access from that. Now the pandemic uh, daycare centers, I'm not qualified to answer. Okay, would someone like to take Deborah's second question? I don't know if Deborah's still unmuted. Deborah, do you want to ask your second question? I, I want to say she was asking about the requirements. This is this is Rep. Ingram. There mm -hmm. are requirements that have to be met: room size, uh, the common space. There can only be a certain number of students that are there, as well as uh, the number of persons who are there at the daycare site. They have to be approved uh, and given a pandemic a daycare certification from Jobs and Family Services. So there is a requirement that needs to be met. The difficulty is, is that we still have folks that say if you were used to having 40 students or 40 children, uh, you now have eight uh, because of the requirement. And therefore, there are dollars that are, are still being lost. And unfortunately, Jobs and Family Services is having a hard time paying some of those pandemic centers. And so, it uh, is interesting to see how it will continue to go, uh, but there is a requirement. There has to be a certification in order to be declared a pandemic uh, requirement, uh, pandemic daycare site. And remember, as of right now, only persons uh, that have children or the persons who are um, have to be required to be on, uh, what do they call it? Necessary people. What's what's the word we use? Anyway, whatever word we use. Essential. Yeah. Essential. essential. Whatever. You know, I don't know what that means. I think everybody's essential. But right. it, but anyway, the most necessary people get to send their children there. So the issue is when we still talk about, and I believe that Leader Sykes 
alluded to this, what are we going to do with those children when it's time to go back to school or when we open it up for more people to go back to work? Right. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Kareem has been on the phone for a while. Kareem, would you, or I should say on the, in the queue, Kareem, are you unmuted? Renee, can you unmute Kareem, please? Kareem, are you ready? We're gonna have this down to a science by next week, everybody. <laughs> okay, Kareem, and I've passed your question. Oh, well, I'm gonna ask Kareem's question because it looks like Deborah's still on the line. Okay. Oh, I'm not. I'm Ooh. Okay. Yeah, you're still on. That's okay. Okay, Kareem's question. Um, he said- Kareem is here. Oh, Kareem, okay, go right ahead. I just ask wanted to talk. Talk. Thank you all for, for this information is so valuable. Thank you all so much for collecting this together. I want to talk about trauma. And most of our children um, are dealing with trauma on a normal basis. And now I believe everyone has experienced trauma on some level, um, and our families included. What type of mental health component uh, do you all see there being to deal with this? Because we're, we're having Sesame Street talk about the COVID. And so it's, it's trickling down. Our parents are going to need this. If, if they've been impacted economically, that's trauma. If they've been impacted um, other ways, then, then that's trauma too. Housing may be impacted. Can we just talk about any plans to deal with the mental health component of um, trauma-informed care, uh, educationally, any, anything with, with respect to trauma? Okay, and I'm thinking that would be a good question for Dr. Henderson. Do you want to um, talk a little bit about the trauma and right, you know, the right. fact that it's on Sesame Street is something else? Well, it, it, is a, it is an excellent question, and it, the answer to it depends upon the, you know, the age of the person you're, you're dealing with. And uh, Kareem pointed out that it could be from children to people who are elderly. From the standpoint of the, the, the kids, I think we have to deal with them where they are. Um, that is obviously being honest with them, answering the questions that they ask, and not trying to burden them with uh, information that uh, they didn't ask. Um, but keeping that line of communication open is going to be essential as far as helping them to, to deal with that. All of our lives are changed, and they're going to be changed for a very long time and probably forever. Um, but um, and so it's the children, of course, are resilient, but nevertheless, they, they um, require nurturing, which we can only do by uh, talking with them on an individual basis um, when they ask questions. Right, absolutely. Um, it's, it's tough. I mean, it's tough, and I know there are a lot of uh, professionals out there trying to help us deal with that. Children of all age, ages are experiencing trauma as well as adults, and that's, that's, it's, it's a really difficult time. Um, Dr. Henderson, while I have you here, uh, Dr. Roosevelt Walker, who's president of the Cincinnati Medical Association, wants you to address the importance of having a primary care physician as an access to health care. Uh, thank you. Um, as what the, the question that was asked um, before, just from the standpoint of testing, in order to get testing done at this point, you need to have a referral. Um, but th that's, that's one aspect of this. The second thing is that in a time where we're um, shut down um, and uh, don't really want to go to the emergency room, where a lot of our folks actually get their care, you need to have someone to call in order to ask them about the symptoms that you might be experiencing. Um, and they can direct you over the phone uh, about what to do uh, with those particular symptoms. So if you don't have a primary care physician, you don't have someone that can give you a cogent device, I'm sorry, advice, uh, or someone that actually knows your history. So that's why it's very important to have a primary care physician. And we have to rely a lot less upon the emergency rooms. That's one of those things that the uh, disparities, uh, uh, why we have such disparities in health and, and health care, because we get too much of our care from the emergency rooms. So the primary care physicians are your gateway into the system. And this, you need that gateway really, really a lot at this um, point in time. 
Okay, thank you so much. And I, I want to point out too that uh, Dr. Melba Moore was on our first panel, and she, you know, she's our Cincinnati Health Commissioner, and she said, if you don't have a primary care physician, we have one for you. There's six Cincinnati health clinics around the city, and so um, anyone without a primary care physician can go to one of those. Uh, actually, anyone can go, but if you don't have a primary care physician, she says, please come to one of the Cincinnati health department clinics, and there are six of them. Um, and then you can also go to um, the, the new clinic, um, 1701 uh, Mercy Place, which um, CEAI just opened, and Dr. Melvin will see you there. So, um, okay, so here's, here's a comment from Victoria Strawn. And she said, um, I really wish we would stop pushing vaccines and talk about treatment in the form of antiretroviral methods. She said, why are we pushing to give or add more vaccines? I guess I can, I'll take a shot at that one. Um, the, the, the retrovirals, if they prove to be effective, then that's, that's a wonderful thing. Um, we haven't found one yet that's effective for uh, uh, COVID-19 or for this uh, particular coronavirus. Um, the uh, uh, rin, rin, remdesivir is being tested, but it's not uh, um, been approved as of yet. And so there's no, there's no retroviral that actually has been developed that is effective in treatment. And so if without a, uh, and these other drugs that uh, some people have been uh, proposing um, have to be tested for their safety and their efficacy, and they can't be given before they're proven to be effective. And we're finding that to be the problem with the uh, hydroxychloroquine. So without a known or enveloped a retroviral or medication for the treatment, then you have to depend upon the vaccines. And then and the vaccines do take a long time to develop. All right, thank you. Can I jump in, uh, Councilwoman, and, and talk about vaccinations? Because I can understand and appreciate the fear uh, of uh, many people who are concerned about a vaccination that's going to come out and how is it safe and who is it going to be tested on. Um, uh, many, many years ago, I was a, a student at Tuskegee University and for those who are unfamiliar with the uh, the syphilis study that happened there, which was actually not a university sanctioned study, it was <clears throat> in the United States government to test uh, and see how untreated syphilis would react in the bodies of black men in Macon County. And from those types of issues and what we know how uh, the healthcare system has uh, used our bodies, thinking of Henrietta, Harrietta Lacks, as well as how we even got to uh, the entire study of gynecology that black women were, were studied on without um, pain pills or pain medication. It is uh, very understandable that people are not interested in listening to a vaccination conversation. Um, and to that, I say, if you are fearful, it is okay. But I do suggest uh, listening and, and doing the research and finding and seeking out people that you do trust uh, and see what they feel about it, particularly your healthcare providers. And if you have one who looks like you, especially, um, and finding that trusted person is, you know, we're talking about healthcare disparities. So many people don't have primary care physicians, as Dr. Henderson said, because they just don't trust anybody. Um, and I know that is real and it is a real fear and it is a fear that is literally killing people. Uh, and so it's got to be upon the, and I say this all the time, the healthcare profession, especially those who don't check their biases when they walk into their medical professions to start to do that because um, they're not bad people, but they are participating in um, a system that creates health disparities and making it so um, our brothers and sisters are not participating in this. But I will say one more thing about the vaccination. I hope you take a look at the lead uh, vaccination researcher. She is a sister, Dr. Corbett. Uh, she's from South Carolina, but she is uh, leading the charge to make sure that we are all protected. Uh, and I think you'll find her to be very impressive. And if she is a trusted source to you, or if you feel like She's someone you can say, I don't think she would uh, put forth this vaccination uh, knowing that she is a black woman herself. Uh, please look at that. And if it is not enough for you, then it's not enough for you. But please, I hope that everyone who is on this uh, call um, is willing to do 
the research and have the conversations and uh, trust me, I understand and I'm not trying to minimize anybody's fear about what happens with the healthcare community um, and vaccinations and what may be going into your body. Uh, but, you know, knowing that this, most people right now don't have an immunity to it. Um, a vaccination is the end goal that we're getting to, but we're going to all have to do our, our part to make sure that we feel comfortable with it. Uh, and we're asking the right questions and talking to the right people. Thank you so much. Um, before uh, Joe Mallory closes us out, um, let me just say that uh, Sister Victoria Strawn added to what Representative <coughs> was saying, and uh, she's talking about the need to address bias that exists within the medical community uh, at the point of contact. She said, in other words, Black people uh, receive inadequate care due to implicit bias um, that does exist with certain physicians, and she compares it to the point of contact that Black people often have with the police. Um, we could do a whole segment on that because that's, um, that's, that's a really big topic, but uh, Representative Sykes, it goes to what you were saying, going back to the Tuskegee experiment and then moving forward. Um, so, so thank you for your comments on that. Uh, we're running out of time, but um, our NAACP Vice President, Joe Mallory, um, would like to be unmuted. He has a few comments, and then we're going to have to close it out. Well, thank you for letting me speak, uh, Jan Michelle. Um, I want to speak to, you know, today was the last day for voters in Ohio to make a request for their absentee ballot. And that request mm -hmm. deadline was at 12 noon today. So the Secretary of State did put out a directive. And then there is a notice that was also going to be posted. It's going to be posted on election day on the doors of all the boards of elections throughout the entire state. And I pointed out and then my Facebook post is that the, he said there's only two categories of voters that are permitted to vote. And this came through the legislature um, that you have to have a disability or you have to be someone who doesn't have an address so they can do a mailing to you, to you and which is typically the homeless people. Uh, also with the directive in the really small print, it says that if you did not receive your ballot, you can go to the Board of Election for assistance. Now, see, I don't know why they won't come out and say the word. They say assistance. And what that means is you can vote as a provisional voter. And they don't want to let everybody know that they can go to the Board of Elections and vote in person on Election Day as a provisional voter because they're afraid that a lot of people are going to show up. And they're afraid of exposure. They're afraid of long lines and they're afraid of chaos. And the Secretary of State still hasn't really been very clear with his messaging. I've talked to people throughout the state and they are all saying that there is not a lot of clear direction. They won't come out and say what they're supposed to do, but it's written in the directive and they'll say after the fact, well, we did write it in there that if you didn't receive your ballot, you can go to the Board of Elections and get assistance. So I just wanna make it clear, I've tried to make it clear to all the people that I know that you know, I understand with COVID-19, everyone is concerned, but also we can't you know, abdicate our rights. And if everyone is gonna be safe, wear your face mask you out in public, the six, six foot distancing, you know, take all those precautions, but you, know, you are permitted to vote. And it's also federal law with the HAVA, Help America Vote Act, that stated that there has to be a second chance or a fail safe uh, process for people if you did not receive your absentee ballot or if you choose to vote uh, on election day and you didn't make a request, you still permitted to vote as a provisional voter. That is a right that is in the federal law. And the state of Ohio incorporated the HAVA, Help America Vote Act, into state law in some legislation that happened previously. So it's also incorporated, but they don't want to really come out and clearly state it because they're afraid that throughout the state that the voters are going to come show up at the Board of Elections and they want to vote. You know, that is really good information. Thank you so much, Joe. We, we appreciate that. Um, this is April 25th, last day to get your application in so that you can get your ballot and you got to get that ballot in, as you said, April 27th, you got to get it in, in the mail. Well, 27th is the postmark. It has to be postmarked. Got to be the 27th. Right. And they can also go to the Board of Elections and, and use that 24 hour drop box. Yeah. At least do it on the 28th, drop it off before 7 30, 7 30 p.m. 
on the 28th. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Iris wanted to make another comment. So Iris, real quickly, please come in and yes. make a comment. You've thank been you. Before, thank we you. appreciate you being here. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for closing the health gap for having this. And I want to thank anyone that's having conversations around what we're doing in the black community. Anybody that's doing anything, kudos to you. I just wanted to report that uh, we fought on um, Dr. Henderson, the CAI fought to make sure that when you went to the testing site in Bond Hill, that you wouldn't have to have a prescription. We fought for those things at the table with Mercy Health before Mercy um, said yes. So it was, it's been a battle. We fought to get data based on race. We're still fighting on that, but the goal was to make sure testing was available. And I just wanted to tell you all that since we opened up that site, that 149 people uh, got tested on Wednesday, 111 on Thursday, I think it was 80 something yesterday. I'll get a total by tomorrow. We don't know how many were positive and we don't know um, it by race, but we are still pushing. We're pushing to have a site on the West side because we know that there are many African-Americans and or black people that live over there. We're pushing to have an additional one in, in Roselawn. So I just want to say uh, state rep Denson, you said that there's enough expertise in, on this call. There is, whether you're in the Zoom, whether you're on Facebook, whether you're in the community, we all have to do this together. Thank you all. Thanks, Iris. Thank you, Iris. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. Really Thank great you. work. I know the first day that um, that, that clinic opened and there, the car line was just huge. And as, uh, you know, as, as was stated, uh, you can walk in as well. You don't have to drive. You can walk in as well. So that is fantastic. Monday through Saturday, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. 1701 Mercy Place. Um, we have someone from Cleveland, Richard Anderson. Thank you for, for tuning in. And also Kyla Woods from right here at home. Um, all of them are thanking the panelists, which is what I would also like to do. Uh, you have been wonderful. Um, we really appreciate our Ohio House Minority Leader, Representative Amelia Sykes joining us today. Our representatives uh, from the 32nd, um, Representative Catherine Ingram and the 33rd, the Fighting 33rd, Representative Cedric Denson, of course, Bishop Bobby Hilton, who heads up NAN, the National Action Network, and is working for us uh, in Stephanie Summerill Dumas's office as well. We're so excited about that. Um, David Singleton, who just does fantastic work, also my um, law school uh, classmate, so I'm always so proud of him and all the great work he's doing. And um, uh, Dr. Uh, Clyde Henderson with the Cincinnati Medical Association. Really, really appreciate you. So, and a huge thank you to Renee Mahaffey Harris for the Center for Closing the Health Gap for powering this up. We appreciate you and, and all you're doing. Everybody, next week we have a double show. So we're going to make sure it runs on time. Um, we're going to talk about opening up Ohio in the first hour. Uh, and we have some really great guests coming, um, including people uh, from, from the governor's office Office as well, who are going to tell us what does that mean? Um, I'm real skeptical about the whole opening up thing, but you know, let's find out you know what it means for real. And as Representative Sykes said, we're going to get more information tomorrow. The second hour, um, we're going to talk about education. We're going to have our CPS superintendent Laura Mitchell on, as well as other guests, and Vanessa White will be the moderator for that second session. So it's going to be a power packed two hours. So we will see you next week at pm resources.com for daily all day long updated information and we're going to get through this and we're going to come out even better on the other side because we're in it together uh, Jim, Michelle, we are in this together and i also want to just commend ceai and i want to give everyone the address 1701 mercy health way Monday through Friday, Monday through Saturday, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Encourage individuals to go to that site. Um, we really commend and thank you. We are all in this together and we thank you for making testing more easily acceptable for our communities. Thank you all for being a part of today's panel and thank you, Jan Michelle, as our moderator. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.